Welcome back to Story Mode. Today we're going like to be covering things. a game that was quite controversial to say the absolute least when it was first announced a little over 20 years ago. Good God, I'm old. I'm Solo. Here is the history on the making of one of my personal favorite video games of all time and in the Zelda series, Wind Waker. It'll be shared in four parts for simplifying narrative purposes. It's people like games, like, subscribe, etc. And let's get into it. Surprise, this chapter will not start us off just yet with how the Wind Waker was made, but instead we'll like give a quick run through on the history of the Zelda series and its creation. Is it necessary for the sake of this? Probably not, but I am going to keep it streamlined. The first ever game in the series titled The Legend of Zelda was designed and created by Shigeru Miyamoto and Takashi Tezuka. It was initially released in Japan as a launch title for the Famicom in February 1986 and would then be released the following year in the North America for the Nintendo Entertainment System or the NES. The man who actually wrote the backstory of the game for the manual, Keiji Turai, actually was a writer for the show Dragon Ball as well. Not very important, but I thought it was interesting. It would actually take about two years to make the game and it was made in conjunction with Super Mario Brothers. This is important because the focus of Zelda was meant to be the opposite of Mario in that it was not to be linear and score based, but was going to be focused on a story and quest. Miyamoto was intent on creating a miniature world in the game and Tezuka himself was inspired to create a fairy tale similar in setting to the fantasy books of J.R.R. Tolkien, who, if you're not familiar, wrote The Lord of the Rings. The coming of age motif was used in the games as the basis for the story, which is usually the case in epics. And funny enough, the name of the princess was taken, and I didn't know this before starting to research, from Zelda Fitzgerald, the wife of one of my own favorite authors, F. Scott Fitzgerald. He's the guy who wrote The Great Gatsby for people who remember what books are like. The series and many of the games of it are considered rightfully so amongst the best games ever made. A feat that would be further cemented in the years to come, but especially during the Nintendo 64 era, during the time of back-to-back -back releases of Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask. Quite interesting and fascinating indeed, Solo. But this is the part of the story where we then pivot to the development of Wind Waker. The conception and development for the game actually began in 2000, prior to the completion of Majora's Mask for the N64, and actually literally before the completion of the actual GameCube itself. Eiji Anuma, who had directed Majora's Mask, was brought back to direct the project and partnered alongside the series creator Shigeru Miyamoto and Takachi Tezuka, who I'd mentioned earlier. The early concepts of the game designs were meant to follow the realistic and serious designs of Ocarina of Time and meant to showcase the graphics possible with the new upcoming systems capabilities. This was the driving force of the creative team as they set out to make a small sample clip to showcase for the public. The clip would feature a fight between Link and Ganondorf and would be demonstrated to much acclaim at the 2000 Space World Exposition an old school Japanese trade fair show that Nintendo used to host. But while the fans loved what they saw, the game's director, A.G. Anuma, and his creative team are less than enthusiastic. The design process was proving difficult for everyone involved because they wanted to do something a bit more inspired than a retreat of Ocarina of Time. They were at a loss for ideas until one of the team's artists, Yoshiki Haruhana, sketched a cartoonish version of a young Toon Link. That drawing would become the seed around which the entire process would work, as it led to fellow producer Satoru Takizawa to draw a Moblin character, one of Zelda's enemies, in a similar style in response, and thus the unique look of the world in two characters would be established. That's according to Takizawa himself, who said during an interview that the visuals for Link and the Moblin started everything. Things quickly shaped up around how we would have them fight. This, of course, would be in the time in between the 2000 Space World showing that their own wives being interested in what they were working on for the first time ever. As Takazawa said, we were able to create visuals where we could get someone who doesn't usually play video games to want to play one. Thus, the team decided to focus on the new gameplay and combat possibilities opened up by the cell shaded graphics, one that they found felt a lot like an interactive cartoon. For the graphics familiar, the game was built using Maya 3D tool alongside a custom game engine. For the actual setting of the game, according to Anuma, we decided to set the stage of the game out on the ocean. 
We talked about how one gets around on the ocean from island to island. And obviously the best option for this would be a sailboat. That's how we ended up with the game where the wind was blowing constantly around the lands to allow the player to sail and get from place to place. An updated demo clip was then shown the following year, which I know pretty goddamn wild considering that they got that much done that quickly at the 2000 Space World Expo, the same place once again. This would set off one of the most hilariously overblown fan reactions of all time, with the backlash decrying the move from realism to a Zelda for kids, a reaction that ended up annoying Miyamoto, who already had been skeptical of the design choice, but would go on saying, well, we want to make games for kids. And as we know, sometimes change is unlike simply for being changed, not for what's actually being presented. But I loved it then as I do now. However, it would take an additional year, but the Wind Waker would get finished up quickly. It took only two and a half years from start to finish, but The Legend of Zelda Wind Waker would be released in Japan on December 13th, 2002, and in North America on March 24th, 2003. It would, of course, release to widespread critical acclaim, as it should have. The detractors of the art style would still exist because that is a relative preference. It was hard to deny, however, how well made the game was, including its combat mechanics and fresh spin to the Zelda formula. As to whether the design would ever return with the sequel or future iteration of the game, Miyamoto himself said with regards to Zelda, it's not so much that we want to go with tune shading in the future, but we're really happy with how Link came out in this game. This was a very interesting quote. The fact that the artwork on the package can match the artwork in the game is great. In the past, you, you might have had the Game Boy Zelda game where the artwork style didn't match the game. We wanted to cut back on the aspect and have the same link across the different media types inside and outside the game. And there you have it, folks. It was remade for the Wii U in 2013. That could be a little bit addition or added on, but I'm not going to get into that for now. That is as in-depth as possible look at the way that Wind Waker was conceptualized and would go on to release. So, um, hope you enjoyed the episode and we'll be back with a lot more content soon. I'm Solo, it's People Like Games. Like, subscribe, etc. Show some goddamn love.